Welcome to the OTP presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. Get the home field advantage with health care coverage from Farm Bureau Health Plans. They've been protecting Tennesseans since 1947. I'm Mike Keith. As the Titans head back to Miami for the first time since playing the longest game in NFL history, we thought this would be a great opportunity for you to get to know Brent Akers. Brent is the vice president of team operations for the Titans but he's been with the organization since we were the Tennessee Oilers. Brent is a native Middle Tennessean who started with our club as an assistant in ticketing and has worked his way up because of his willingness to do anything and everything, and incredibly, to do all of it well. Throw him a problem of any sort, and he'll find a way to make it work. Brent has one of the most fascinating jobs with the Tennessee Titans, coordinating all elements of team travel, training camp, day-to-day -day operations of Ascension St. Thomas Sports Park, and more. Brent Akers and his crew in ops make the trains run on time for the Tennessee Titans. So now, you'll get a chance to hear some of his stories. This OTP was taped as we drove to East Tennessee to go eat fantastic pizza at Big Ed's in Oak Ridge in one of our Follow Me Through Tennessee episodes. We hit the 2018 Miami game, the longest game in NFL history. We also talk about how the Titans got all of their gear to London, working with coaches, and so much more. So here is Brent Akers on the OTP. We are headed to Oak Ridge, Tennessee because you are the pizza expert. You are one of the world's foremost pizza experts. Make a U-turn. We are. Turn left Stop on telling Old me what Boulevard. to do. Seriously. Turn left. I then know what to do. I'm not sure if expert turn is the right word. Boulevard. Then turn right to I-40 East toward do, Knoxville. I do like to travel around the world and eat pizza. You do like to travel around the world and eat pizza. It's funny because you sent the thing with the top 15 pizza places in America from USA Today. Right. And you had actually been to 12 of them. Yes. That's crazy. It is. And Turn you, right to and you didn't agree Knoxville. with the list because you had been some other places that yeah, you thought were actually better. There's a few more I would add to that list. I think. What? Why is pizza your thing? You know, I grew up eating pizza. That was, I, my mom said I was... I was picky, and I told her I was discerning. Right. <laughs> I've eaten lunch with you a lot of times. I would say you're picky. Picky, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I have a. Starting. Starting when I was a kid at Shakey's. Do you remember Shakey's? I love Shakey's pizza. I had uh, my. Eighth birthday party at Shakey's Pizza. Okay. The player piano yep. and all the games and everything. Did you have the window that you could go see? I did. Yep. So I guess that's where I really started watching pizza. Because you did restaurants before you actually came to work for the I Titans. Did. I did. I bartended and waited tables at J. Alexander's. Oh, good spot. The original. Still a good spot. So Big Ed's Pizza is famous. Um, it's been open over 50 years now, which is crazy. It's still in Big Ed's family, okay. which is really great. John Harris, the general manager, is going to meet us today. Awesome. And, and I have told him that you're coming because you are the pizza expert and that you have requested... Watch out. Vehicle on shoulder ahead. You have requested cheese and pepperoni. And so he is going to set you up. But this place, what's so amazing about it is all they do is pizza and beer. I, mean, I don't hate that. I know. I don't I hate know. that. But, but there's, it's kind of like everything I believe in. <laughs> but there's really something to that based on the fact that they, they've never said, hey, we're a calzone place or we're a salad place or I mean, this is what you're going to get. You're going to walk in, and you're going to smell the pizza, and you know what you're going for, and everybody understands it, and so it's it's not terribly complicated for 
for the customer or I would imagine for the people who work there. I'm excited. Keep it simple, right? Keep it simple and do what you do well. Do what you do well. That's exactly right. But I I remember going out there for the first time in 1976. How far was your home from there? Uh, well, we lived at that time in Chattanooga, but we were up for a football weekend and we went there after a game on a Saturday night and waited, golly, had to wait well over an hour. I remember it's, because my dad would not wait. He would walk in somewhere and if there was a wait, we turned around and left. And he knew even going in, you were going to have to wait and it was going to be Watch worth out. it. Vehicle on shoulder ahead. And the best part was, you know, you got Big Ed standing at the bar. And Big Ed was a Marine. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and he was a big guy. I mean, he wasn't tall. I think he's probably six feet, six one. But, I mean, he was imposing and had that look on his face and... I mean, it was clearly Big Ed's place. Clearly. Not just in the name, but I mean, he was, it was his deal. So, part of the reason you went was to see Big Ed. Right. And then, to see them make the pizza, they cut the pizza with scissors. So, it's not Chicago style. Not Chicago. Do you think Chicago style is sacrilegious? Is that what you say? I don't think so. I think it has its... Pluses and minus. To me, it's more like a casserole. <laughs> it's like I get a quiche. Um, now, I do love some of the them style Chicago style pizza. It's underrated, I think, because they talk about and I love the Chicago style. When we go to my wife's hometown, uh, we've been to a place called Broncos, which is okay. just. It ain't a chain. Right. Uh, I don't know if Bronco's in there or not, but it, I mean, they make their own deep dish pizza. And, it, and I, I like the ones from the brand names, the Geno's and all those people in Chicago, but um, the, the local ones in, you know, the Illinois towns, the suburbs of Chicago. And my wife's hometown is basically a suburb of Chicago. It's fantastic because it's got a different. It's different than just your basic deep dish. And I love it. But I'm a, I'm a person, I'm less discerning than you. I claim I've never had bad pizza. Well, and that's one of the reasons I started eating pizza when I would travel. You know, I'd be gone five or six days. And one of the fortunate things, I've got to travel pretty much all over the country with this job. And bad pizza is going to be all right. Even the worst pizza is going to be all right. And that's the whole thing. I mean, you get it out of the box at Kroger, you know, out of the freezer case, it's still good to me. Now, some's better than others. Sure, sure. Clearly. But it's kind of like a hamburger. It's hard to go wrong with a hamburger. The, uh, by the way, so I was going through the, uh, the TennesseeTitans.com website, and it was because I was looking for your formal title team operations vice president or are you vice president comma team operations which I is think so. that's it what's the deal with your picture the picture yes from last year for blood <laughs> <laughs> that is so, that is so bad you are still <laughs> using the picture of you from when you got hired that was in 99 yes yeah. so you i mean you they have never forced you to get an they updated picture. picture. HR hasn't said you have to come in. And it's funny you say that because, <laughs> you know, this year the league is talking about uh, requiring pictures on all credentials throughout the league. Right. Kansas City is one that's done it. So uh, Chris and Nick and Luke are trying to get me to get a new picture. Made. It's, it's kind of fun now. So now it's a game. Now it's a game. There's now no chance game. it changes. I still look the same, don't I, Mike? I mean, yeah, I mean you do. But you don't. I don't. I mean, it's kind of like all of us. It happens. It was a couple of years ago. It's a couple. It was a minute ago. I think the other thing in that picture is I'm wearing a tie. 
Yes. But we but, but we, we all did. We were a Thai culture. Yeah. I mean in ninety eight when we came to work for the team, you had on a tie every day yes. in the office. More with Titans Vice President of Operations Brent Akers coming up on the OTP, but first a word from SeatGeek, the official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. Whether you're buying or selling tickets to Titans games or any other live event in Nashville, SeatGeek is the place to do it. SeatGeek, the new official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans, so Titans fans can fan. We continue with Brent Akers on the OTP. So, how many people work in the ops department? Take, go through everybody who works in ops. So Chris Matuzic yeah. was a long snapper at, at MTSU, and he worked there for, I think, 12 years, 14 years. Okay. And then he started in 16. So he's our director of uh, team operations and facilities. So Chris has done a great job with our new building and, and really maintaining the, the whole football side of it. Okay. And then with that, we both kind of handle the grounds crew, and kind of the grass and everything associated with the building. Uh, Luke Morrow went to A&M. He's Explain, been with us. Explains this, a lot, doesn't it? It does. It really does. Uh, he's been with us since 17. And then uh, Nick Hardesty, former UT Ball. Nick was our intern, training camp intern, and... In 16. Well, and you got to say, too, Nick Hardesty's dad, Rick Hardesty, is, is one of the all time without question great friends of the program. Absolutely. So it's only natural that Nick Hardesty would be awesome anyway. They are both phenomenal. And Chris does a great job, too. So you, they're full. Four? cover a lot. A lot of, nobody knows. It's crazy. What I would do. One of my big things is the food. Uh, I, starting in 14, did everything. We, we didn't have a kitchen like that. We had donuts on the side. Yeah. Everything had to be made off site. It could, right. be, it could be warmed and you could grill. Right. But there there wasn't any and now it's phenomenal. Did you design that? We did. So I traveled all around looking at different facilities, different places. Went to Knoxville to visit Nick and look at UT set up. Went to a bunch of colleges. Multiple pro teams. Now you can, you know, it's so funny because it was so different starting in the 90s how players ate yes. and how they wanted to eat. And I always say the only guy I ever saw doing it the right way to start with was Eddie George. Absolutely. And then there were others that sort of ticked through that you could see they – I like a donut, but they weren't going to have a donut. No. And then you hear all the Tom Brady stuff, and the, it's funny because the public hears about his avocado ice cream, and they think that is just gross. And while I don't think I want avocado ice cream, I get what they're talking about with him in terms of how he takes care of his body, and now... More guys do that than do the other way. Absolutely. Because you remember, and, and I try not to tell the same stories over and over, but I feel like I am. The period from when the off-season program ends in June to when training camp started, it was, for the coaching staff, it was almost hell because they were so fearful that guys would go off and gain 30 pounds. And, and some of them did. I mean, there were guys in the late 90s who would show up and they'd be 20, 25 pounds heavier because they were so big and they'd just start eating and not do anything. Now, gosh, that never happens. Never happens. 
and we're extremely fortunate that Amy built this beautiful kitchen for us and they can eat anything they want for the most part. If you like avocado ice cream, they'll make avocado ice cream. But they also, these guys, have started in their Power Five and most of these big schools are learning about nutrition, learning about what to eat in college. But they're still 18 year olds wanting a chicken thing, but you know, they know at some point we need what's right for them. And we have a nutritionist. We have a nutritionist. Which, ironically enough, was me for a bunch of years. You were the nutritionist. Yes. And we're going to eat pizza. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, I mean, this is this is different. And, it, and, I mean, you do you still have some fun things in there. I've walked through there and smelled a couple things. But, yeah, that's... Uh... But you have to. Because yeah. you've got to get them to eat. Or if not, they're going to go somewhere else to eat. Well, I mean, you remember Samari Roll. All he ate was like Skittles or something. I mean, it was great. Mac and cheese. Mac and cheese. I had to get it specially made at hotels. The hotel meals. Right. How? What's that like? So it's very calculating what we do. We have usually lean meat, some sort of uh, fish. Always have chicken. Chicken is everywhere. It's kind of the staple. It's, it's like pizza to me. Chicken and broccoli. Uh, and we'll have various stations always have a pasta bar so multiple starches and Lauren's done a great job of really fine-tuning our menu for what we do but a lot of teams do the same we're all pretty similar in how we how we feed our players and then we also try to do the similar thing every week just like staying in a hotel every week so you get in a routine and you kind of have a plan going forward for the game some guys don't eat breakfast you've seen them they might have a smoothie or a well, yeah, I mean, the, pre, the pregame meal part of it is so individualized because some guys come down and they have breakfast. Right. Some guys want a steak or pasta, and then some guys have a hard time eating. Because they're nervous. Because they're nervous. But, you know, that's the incredible thing to me is they're going to come down and get a meal at, let's say, 8, 8.30 for a noon game central time. And then they're not going to eat again until 4.30. Starving. They're starving. It's crazy. So silly as it is, peanut butter and jelly is like a staple in our locker. All right. So that leads me to the peanut butter and jelly story. <laughs> I want to know what really happened when the Titans played the season opener at Miami in what turned out to be the longest game in NFL history, seven hours and eight minutes. Yes. And you had the two long delays. Yes. Is the story true that someone or someone's from the ops staff went to the grocery store to get bread and peanut butter? True story. Okay. True story. We used to carry a trunk with us full of peanut butter and jelly. Okay. With all the bread in there typically, but when it happened, and I, I want to say, Mike, it was the second quarter it started. Yeah. Uh, we started making PB&Js, and the guys were hungry, so they came in, and then they changed their sweat and socks, undershirts. We started making PB&Js. Even the general manager was helping make it. <laughs> and then the second break, we started making more PB&J, and then we ran out of bananas and ran up on oranges, I think it was the third or fourth break. Then we went to half, which was shorter. Was it not even? I think it, no. I think it was normal. Was it normal? Yeah. More PB and J's, and then our post game food came, which was a uh, Mission Barbecue. So next thing you know, in the third quarter, we're eating our post game food, uh, and then I get a call that we're out of bread and out of PB and J's. So I go to the concessionaire, who's in the front of mine that works for the Dolphins, helping me get two more loaves of bread that we went through very quickly. So at the end of the game, I was out of peanut butter, we were out of barbecue, we were out of everything. Uh, it was crazy. Finally, at one point, we're sitting there and everybody's about to lose their mind, as you probably were as well. And the quarterback at the time, Marcus, said, I really just want a pepperoni pizza. So Luke Morrow on our staff, I gave him my credit card. He goes into the concourse and gets a pizza. So Marcus is eating pizza in the, you know, maybe that was the fourth quarter at that point. Okay. And then next thing you know, players see it. They're like, oh, I want a pizza. Oh, wow. Here we go. 
So next thing you know, Luke's up there and he takes a cooler and he fills the cooler full of personal pizzas. And the players ate pizza. So not what I would recommend is from a nutrition standpoint. But you gotta keep fuel gotta somehow. Keep fuel. Because those guys, I mean that what was so crazy, you know, it's a one o'clock local time start. It's September. It was incredibly humid before the rain started. Oh, it was so hot. Oh, it's brutal. And so everybody is sweating their hind end off. And wasn't it just like freezing in the in the locker room? Freezing in the locker room. Then they ended up setting up chairs. We took all the chairs out of the locker room, put them out in the main lobby part of the underbelly of the stadium. I've never worked that hard in anything. I bet Chris and I handed out 7,000 cups of water on the sideline. I've never seen anything like it. Because in your job, I mean, the amazing thing, I mean, 25 plus years with the club and doing what you do, the job is whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to help the players do whatever we can do. I mean, and no matter just, what your title is or no matter how long you've been there or what you get paid or your status, right. you're there to serve the head coach and the general manager and anybody who needs anything to keep the train running on time. Absolutely. Is that the best way to describe it? It's pretty much a little bit of everything. I mean, we cover a lot of different areas. A player's family needs a car or whatever we can help with. I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing what we do. But from every from everything that we do is very calculated to take care of the players, too. Whether it's the meals in the plane that we have custom, whether it's the snacks, the kind bars, whatever we do on the plane that's passed through. So. How hard is it to set up the planes? The planes are difficult for us, and especially with after not after uh, COVID, everybody's traveling again. Right. So the availability of these planes have gotten. So let me ask you one that I get all the time, and yep. you can give a better answer. Why do NFL teams, with the exception of the Patriots, not not have their own jumbo planes? Why does that not make sense? Because you really you, you don't use it enough. I mean, you you look at uh, if you're going to Austin, Texas tomorrow, and you can find you have a ten o'clock flight. That plane that you're on has probably been to four other places right before it picks you up. And it's probably changed crew two to three times. And then it's going to change crew again and probably go to five more places. So those planes never sit anywhere. And it's actually bad for them not to, not to be used. So that just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. If you're, if you're a, I mean, I guess if you're an NBA team, it might make sense. You don't it's think so? Not. How big are the planes, Jim? Seven sixes for the most part. Seven six seven, three hundred and four hundred. Seats about two hundred and twenty-five people, basically, depending on the configuration. How many do we actually travel in terms of people? Usually about one hundred and fifty-five. Okay. And the players are not even half of them. Yeah. It's with nineteen medical people last year. Is that right? You include doctors and emergency medicine people, and trainers. I mean, our coaching staff, Mike, has grown as you see. I mean, when when you started in ops, what was the normal travel part? We were on a seven, like seven thirty-seven smaller plane. It was around a hundred, hundred and twenty. <laughs> And going to London, we have we're gonna get over two hundred rooms for that game. Wow. wow. That's crazy. How how hard is the London trip to coordinate from the standpoint of um, okay, everything. You know it's the hard part is it's just another game. <laughs> but it's really not. Yeah. It's one of seventeen, but right. it's really not. It's yeah. really not. Um the, the, one of the harder parts is getting all our stuff there, getting through customs. So every year we go through every trunk. We have 
Last year we traveled with 19,200 pounds of equipment. So that includes extra shoes. Whoa, whoa, say that again. 19,200 pounds. So that's nine and a half tons. Yes. Okay. Good math, Mike. Thank you. Um, and everything has to be documented and put select. So this trunk, we have them all labeled, all weighed very specific data on what it is inside. So this is 12 pairs of Nike shoes. Well, then you also have a value associated with them that you have to give for tariffs in London. So that takes a long time, a lot of detail for that. So you can't fly it all? You can't. So we will have an ocean ship. We have a big container coming in the loading dock. That when we went in 18, we filled it full of Everything that you can think of that you can't get in England. What can't you get in England? You can't get uh, barbecue sauce. You really? You can't get hot sauces. Different. Some of the different things are, they're just different. Even the ketchup's different. We had ketchup. We had cases of ketchup. So you have to have, you got to think about all of that. So what will be the weight or what was the weight in 18 of the container that went across the ocean? I have no idea. <laughs> so when, when do you have to have, when would that have to be ready to go? How, how, how much before the game? Because you're, I mean, it's right. a ship, it's not fast. Right, so it'll leave right during the middle of training, probably okay. August 1st. And where will it be for the whole period of time before the game? Yeah, it'll, they'll take it to Rocket Cargo is the company that does it. And it will get on a ship and it will sail across. And then they'll hold it in their facility. And then it has to go through customs and then it has to go through all that. And then they'll take it and bring it to our hotel. And right, then our advanced, and our advanced guys, uh, Chris and Nick and Luke, will go through it and set it all up. When did they have to get there? That's the hard part because you lose a whole day just yeah. for the travel. So they'll leave Monday night and land Tuesday morning. Because and we will have just had a game. Just had a game. Yeah. yeah. A road game. So that's a tough turn. Cool. What about the food? Because the food in England is not the same. It's different. Everything's different. So that we went a couple weeks ago and actually... Oh, you went to England? We did. Okay. Uh, Luke and Chris and I spent four days there at the hotel and looking at the hotels and going to the stadium and trying to get a plan, which is a beautiful stadium, by the way. It's a real-life football stadium. It is a real-life football stadium. But it's just, a, it's just one of 17. You've got to be just as good in Indianapolis... Right. The week before, as you do in London, and yet you've been to Indianapolis once a year for 20 something yeah. years. But it's still a game, too, that you got to win. Oh, well, it's a division game? Yeah, it's a big yeah. game. But, I mean, but can, can you guys almost do Indianapolis and Jacksonville and Houston with your eyes closed now? I don't think eyes closed, but, the, you know, people change, hotels change, contacts and stadiums change. From an operational standpoint, it is a very good city. As you know, it's what three miles from the. Yeah, that's great. Our hotel is typically within a five-minute bus ride. It's almost takes longer to ride the bus than it does to walk. Is that where you had someone commandeer a bus one time? That is a true story. <laughs> You had a staff member just decide he would take his own bus? Yes, he did. Then he threw a little tantrum and he and I almost got into a fight. <laughs> because that, that threw off your schedule. In a bus. <laughs> <laughs> we only had five of them. So he just decided. He missed the bus. He missed the bus. Yeah, and then he threw a fit because he missed the bus and threw a smoothie on the sidewalk. And then he and I came to uh, blows in the locker room. Uh -huh. He was uh, uh, shorter than me, which is not, which is hard to do, right? Uh, <laughs> and he got in my face in the locker room. And I remember Rocky Boyman was like, "Get him! Y'all fight!" <laughs> <laughs> it is 
said that that's the maddest you've ever been. I was furious. And then Jeff Fisher found me later. And I was like, oh, great. He goes, you got a second. You know, I said, like, sure, coach. He goes, tell me about what happened. Said, well, this staff member decided to take his own bus. <laughs> <laughs> because he missed the bus. Oh my goodness. He goes, now tell me about the altercation. <laughs> I mean, and did I you said, really throw? We didn't throw. Okay. I mean, I would have won. Oh, I, yeah, I know. I was hot. I don't mess with you. I was wearing an actual suit that day. Yeah. And I threw my jacket down. I'll never forget it. That's so great. But Jeff, he was great. He goes, well, tell me this. He goes, was it ever a fight? I said, no, sir. No, sir. Nothing. Everything's great. He was great. Good. We're going to move on. We're going to win this game. And about 30 minutes later, he, st he stops me again. I said, hey, coach. He said, uh, all right, just tell me one time. If you're in eighth grade on the playground, <laughs> would you have kicked his ass? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, coach. There's no doubt that I would have uh, That's Brett Akers, the Tennessee Titans Vice President of Team Operations. A special thanks now to our friends at Duncan, who remind you that it's always game on with Duncan. So grab a coffee and kick off the action, whether that's drinking a cup on your way to the game or grabbing one to go before listening to the game at home. Duncan is always there to help you get your game on, just like the pros we need to be at our best come game time, which is why Duncan is the most important part of your game day ritual. It's always the best call for football. America runs on Duncan. I'm Mike Keith, thanking you for joining me for the OT.